Chapter Four of the Dealings of Captain Sharkey and Other Stories of Pirates by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. How Copley Banks slew Captain Sharkey. The Buccaneers were something higher than a mere band of marauders. They were a floating republic with laws, usages, and discipline of their own. In their endless and remorseless quarrel with the Spaniards, they had some semblance of right upon their side. Their bloody harryings of the cities of the main were not more barbarous than the inroads of Spain upon the Netherlands, or upon the Caribs in these same American lands. The chief of the buccaneers, were he English or French, a Morgan or a Grandmont, was still a responsible person whose country might countenance him, or even praise him, so long as he refrained from any deed which might shock the leathery seventeenth-century conscience too outrageously. Some of them were touched with religion, and it is still remembered how Sawkins threw the dice overboard upon the Sabbath and Daniel pistoled a man before the altar for irreverence. But there came a day when the fleets of the buccaneers no longer mustered at the Tortugas, and the solitary and outlawed pirate took their place. Yet even with him the tradition of restraint and of a discipline still lingered, and among the early pirates, the Averys, the Englands, and the Robertses, there remained some respect for human sentiment. They were more dangerous to the merchant than to the seaman. But they in turn were replaced by more savage and desperate men, who frankly recognized that they would get no quarter in their war with the human race, and who swore that they would give as little as they got. Of their histories we know little that is trustworthy. They wrote no memoirs and left no trace, save an occasional blackened and blood-stained derelict adrift upon the face of the Atlantic. Their deeds could only be surmised from the long roll of ships which never made their port. Searching the records of history, it is only here and there in an old-world trial that the veil that shrouds them seems for an instant to be lifted and we catch a glimpse of some amazing and grotesque brutality behind. Such was the breed of Ned Lowe, of Gow the Scotchman, and of the infamous Sharkey, whose coal-black bark, the happy delivery, was known from the Newfoundland banks to the mouths of the Orinoco as the dark forerunner of misery and of death. There were many men, both among the islands and on the main, who had a blood feud with Sharkey, but not one who had suffered more bitterly than Copley Banks of Kingston. Banks had been one of the leading sugar merchants of the West Indies, he was a man of position, a member of the council, the husband of Percival, and the cousin of the governor of Virginia. His two sons had been sent to London to be educated, and their mother had gone over to bring them back. On their return voyage, the ship, the Duchess of Cornwall, fell into the hands of Sharkey, and the whole family met with an infamous death. Copley Banks said little when he heard the news, but he sank into a morose and enduring melancholy. He neglected his business, avoided his friends, and spent much of his time in the low taverns of the fishermen and seamen. There, amidst riot and devilry, he sat silently puffing at his pipe, with a set face and a smoldering eye. It was generally supposed that his misfortunes had shaken his wits, and his old friends looked at him askance, for the company which he kept was enough to bar him from honest men. From time to time there came rumors of Sharky over the sea. Sometimes it was from some schooner which had seen a great flame upon a horizon, and approaching to offer help to the burning ship, had fled away at the sight of the sleek black bark lurking like a wolf near a mangled sheep. Sometimes it was a frightened trader, which had come tearing in with her canvas curled like a lady's bodice, because she had seen a patched fore topsail rising slowly above the violet waterline. Sometimes it was from a coaster, which had found a waterless Bahama city littered with sun-dried bodies. Once there came a man who had been mate of a guineaman, and who had escaped from the pirate's hands. He could not speak, for reasons which Sharkey could best supply, but he could write, and he did write, to the very interest of Copley Banks. For hours they sat together over the map and the dumb man pointed here and there to outlying reefs and tortuous inlets, while his companion sat smoking in silence, with his unvarying face and his fiery eyes. One morning, some two years after his misfortune, Mr. Copley Banks strode into his own office with an old air of energy and alertness. The manager stared at him in surprise, for it was months since he had shown any interest in business. "'Good morning, Mr. Banks,' said he. "'Good morning, Freeman. I see that ruffling Harry is in the bay.' Yes, sir, she clears for the Windward Islands on Wednesday. I have other plans for a freeman. I have determined upon a slaving venture to Waida. But her cargo is ready, sir. Then it must come out again, freeman. My mind is made up, and the ruffling Harry must go slaving to Waida. All argument and persuasion were in vain, so the manager had dolefully to clear the ship once more. And then Copley Banks began to make preparations for his African voyage. It appeared that he relied upon force rather than barter for the filling of his hold, for he carried none of those showy trinkets which savages love but the brig was fitted with eight nine-pounder guns and racks full of muskets and cutlasses. The after sail room next to the cabin was transformed into a powder magazine, and she carried as many round-shot as a well-found privateer. 
water and provisions were shipped for a long voyage. But the preparation of his ship's company was most surprising. It made Freeman, the manager, realize that there was truth in the rumor that his master had taken a leave of his senses. For, under one pretext or another, he began to dismiss the old and tried hands, who had served the firm for years, and in their place he embarked the scum of the port, men whose reputations were so vile that the lowest crimp would have been ashamed to furnish them. There was Berthman Sweetlocks, who was known to have been present at the killing of the logwood cutters, so that his hideous scarlet disfigurement was put down by the fanciful as being a red afterglow from his great crime. He was first mate, and under him was Israel Martin, a little sun-wilted fellow who had served with Howell Davies at the taking of Cape Coast Castle. The crew were chosen from among those whom Banks had met and known in their own infamous haunts, and his own table steward was a haggard-faced man, who gobbled at you when he tried to talk. His beard had been shaved, and it was impossible to recognize him as the same man whom Sharkey had placed under the knife, and who had escaped to tell his experiences to Copley Banks. These doings were not unnoticed, nor yet uncommented upon in the town of Kingston. The commandant of the troops, Major Harvey of the artillery, made serious representations to the governor. "'She is not a traitor, but a small warship,' said he. "'I think it would be well to arrest Copley Banks and seize the vessel.' "'What do you suspect?' asked the governor, who was a slow-witted man, broken down with fevers and port wine. "'I suspect,' said the soldier, "'that it is Steed Bonnet over again.' Now Steve Bonnet was a planter of high reputation and religious character, who, from some sudden and overpowering freshet of wildness in his blood, had given up everything in order to start off pirating in the Caribbean Sea. The example was a recent one, and it had caused the utmost consternation in the islands. Governors had before now been accused of being in league with pirates, and of receiving commissions upon their plunder, so that any want of vigilance was open to a sinister construction. "'Well, Major Harvey,' said he, "'I am vastly sorry to do anything which may offend my friend Copley Banks. For many a time have my knees been under his mahogany. But in face of what you say there is no choice for me but to order you to board the vessel and to satisfy yourself as to her character and destination.' So at one in the morning, Major Harvey, with a launch full of his soldiers, paid a surprise visit to the ruffling Harry, with the result that they picked up nothing more solid than a hempen cable floating at the mooring. It had been slipped by the brig, whose owner had scented danger. She had already passed the Palisades, and was beating out against the northeast trades on a course for the windward passage. When upon the next morning the brig had left Morant Point, a mere haze upon the southern horizon, the men were called aft, and Copley Banks revealed his plans to them. He had chosen them, he said, as brisk boys and lads of spirit, who would rather run some risk upon the sea than starve for a living upon the shore. King's ships were few and weak, and they could master any trader who could come their way. Others had done well at the business, and with a handy, well-founded vessel, there was no reason why they should not turn their tarry jackets into velvet coats. If they were prepared to sail under the black flag, he was ready to command them, but if any wished to withdraw, they might have a gig and row back to Jamaica. Four men out of sixty-four asked for their discharge, went over the ship's side into the boat, and rowed away amidst the jeers and howlings of the crew. The rest assembled aft and drew up the articles of their association. A square of black tarpaulin had a white skull painted upon it, and was hoisted amidst cheering at the main. Officers were elected, and the limits of their authority fixed. Copley Banks was chosen captain, but, as there were no mates upon a private craft, Birthmark Sweetlocks came quartermaster, and Israel Martin the boatswain. There was no difficulty in knowing what was the custom of the Brotherhood, for half the men, at least, had served upon pirates before. Food should be the same for all, and no man should interfere with another man's drink. The captain should have a cabin, but all hands should be welcome to enter it when they choose. All should share and share alike, save only the captain, quartermaster, boatswain, carpenter, and master gunner, who had from a quarter to a whole extra share. He who saw a prize first should have the best weapon taken out of her. He who boarded her first should be the richest suit of clothes aboard of her. Every man may treat his own prisoner, be it man or woman, after his own fashion. If a man flinched from his gun, the quartermaster should pistol him. These were some of the rules which the crew of the Ruffling Harry subscribed by putting forty-two crosses at the foot of the paper upon which they had been drawn. So a new rover was afloat upon the seas, and her name, before a year was over, became as well known as that of the happy delivery. From the Bahamas to the Leewards, and from the Leewards to the Windwards, Copley Banks became the rival of Sharkey and the terror of traders. For a long time the bark and the brig never met, which was the most singular, as the ruffling Harry was forever looking in at Sharkey's resorts. But at last one day, when she was passing down the inlet of Coxon's Hole at the east end of Cuba, with the intent of careening, there was happy delivery, with her blocks and tackle falls already rigged for the same purpose. Copley Banks fired a shotted salute and hoisted the green trumpeter ensign, as the custom was among gentlemen of the sea. Then he dropped his boat and went aboard. 
Captain Sharkey was not a man of genial mood, nor had he any kindly sympathies for those who were of the same trade as himself. Copley Banks had him seated the stride upon one of the after guns, with his New Englander quartermaster, Ned Galloway, and a crowd of roaring ruffians standing about him. Yet none of them roared with quite such assurance when Sharkey's pale face and filmy blue eyes were turned upon him. He was in his shirt sleeves, and his cambric frills breaking through these open red satin long flapped vest. The scorching sun seemed to have no power upon his fleshless frame, for he wore a low fur cap, as though it had been winter. A many colored band of silk passed across his body, and supported a short, murderous sword, while his broad, brass buckled belt was stuffed with pistols. Sink you for a preacher, he cried as Copley Banks passed over the bulwarks. I will drub you with an inch of your life and that inch also. What mean you by fishing in my waters? Copley Banks looked at him, and his eyes were like those of a traveler who sees his home at last. I am glad we are of one mind, said he, for I myself am of opinion that the seas are not large enough for the two of us. But if you will take your sword and pistols and come upon the sandbank with me, then the world will be rid of a damned villain whichever way it goes. Now this is talking, cried Sharkey, jumping off the gun and holding out his hand. I have not yet met many who would look upon John Sharkey in the eyes and speak with a full breath. May the devil seize me if I did not choose you as a consort. But if you play me false, then I will come aboard of you and gut you upon your own poop. And I pledge you the same, said Copley Banks, and so the two pirates became sworn comrades to each other. That summer they went north as far as the Newfoundland banks and harried the New York traders and the whale ships from New England. It was Copley Banks who captured the Liverpool ship, House of Hanover, but it was Sharkey who fastened her master to the windlass and pelted him to death with empty claret bottles. Together they engaged the king's ship Royal Fortune, which had been sent in search of them, and beat her off after a night's action of five hours, the drunken, raving crews fighting naked in the light of the battle lanterns, with a bucket of rum and a pannikin laid by the tackles of every gun. They ran to Topsail Inlet in North Carolina to refit, and then in the spring they were at the Grand Caicos, ready for the long cruise down to the West Indies. By this time, Sharkey and Copley Banks had become very excellent friends, for Sharkey loved a wholehearted villain, and he loved a man of metal, and it seemed to him that the two met in the captain of the ruffling Harry. It was long before he gave his confidence to him, for cold suspicion lay deep in his character. Never once would he trust himself outside his own ship and away from his own men. But Copley Banks came often on board the happy delivery, and joined Sharkey in many of his morose debauches, so that at last any lingering misgivings of the latter were set at rest. He knew nothing of the evil which he had done to his new boon companion, for of his many victims how could he remember the woman and the two boys who had slain with such levity so long ago? When, therefore, he received a challenge to himself and to his quartermaster for a carouse upon the last evening of their stay at the Cagos Bank, he saw no reason to refuse. A well-found passenger ship had been rifled a week before, so their fare was of the best, and after supper five of them drank deeply together. There were the two captains, Birthmark Sweetlocks, Ned Galloway, and Israel Martin, the old buccaneersman. To wait upon them was the dumb steward, whose head Sharkey split with his glass because he had been too slow in the filling of it. The quartermaster had slipped Sharkey's pistols away from him, for it was an old joke with him to fire them cross-handed under the table and see who was the luckiest man. It was a pleasantry which had cost his boats in his leg, so now, then the table was cleared, they would coax Sharkey's weapons away from him on the excuse of the heat and lay them out of his reach. The captain's cabin of the ruffling Harry was in a deck house upon the poop, and a stern chaser gun was mounted at the back of it. Round shot were racked around the wall, and three great hogshead of powder made a stand for dishes and for bottles. In this grim room the five pirates sang and roared and drank, while the silent steward still filled up their glasses and passed the box and the candle around for the tobacco pipes. Hour after hour the talk became fouler, the voices hoarser, the curses and shoutings more incoherent, until three of the five had closed their bloodshot eyes and dropped their swimming heads to the table. Copley Banks and Sharkey were left face to face, the one because he had drunk the least, the other because no amount of liquor would ever shake his iron nerve or warm his sluggish blood. Behind him stood the watchful steward, forever filling up his waning glass. From without came the low lapping of the tide, and from over the water a sailor's chanty from the bark. In the windless tropical night the words came clearly to their ears. A trader sailed from Stepney Town. Wake her up, shake her up, try her with the mainsail. A trader sailed from Stepney Town with a keg full of gold and a velvet gown. Ho, oh, the bully rover Jack, waiting with his yard aback out upon the lowland sea. The two boon companions sat listening in silence. Then Copley Banks glanced at the steward and the man took a coil of rope from the shot-rack behind him. 
"'Captain Sharkey,' said Copley Banks, "'do you remember the Duchess of Cornwall, hailing from London, which you took and sank three years off the Statira Shoal?' "'Curse me if I can bear their names in mind,' said Sharkey. "'We did as many as ten ships a week about that time. There were a mother and two sons among the passengers. Maybe that'll bring it back to your mind.' Captain Sharkey leant back in thought, with his huge thin beak of a nose jutting upwards. Then he burst suddenly into a high treble, neighing laugh. He remembered it, he said, and he added details to prove it. But burn me if it had not slipped from my mind, he cried. How came you to think of it? It was of interest to me, said Copley Banks, for the woman was my wife, and the lads were my only sons. Sharkey stared across at his companion, and saw that the smoldering fire which lurked always in his eyes had burned up in a lurid flame. He read their menace, and he clapped his hands to his empty belt. Then he turned to seize a weapon, but the bite of rope was cast around him, and in an instant his arms were bound to his sides. He fought like a wild cat and screamed for help. Ned, he yelled, Ned, wake up! Here's damn villainy! Help, Ned, help! But the three men were far too deeply sunk in their swinish sleep for any voice to wake them. Round and round went the rope until Sharky was swathed like a mummy from ankle to neck. They propped him stiff and helpless against the powder barrel, and they gagged him with a handkerchief but his filmy, red-rimmed eyes still looked curses at them. The dumb man chattered in his exultation, and Sharky winced for the first time when he saw the empty mouth before him. He understood that vengeance, slow and patient, had dogged him long and clutched him at last. The two captors had their plans all arranged, and they were somewhat elaborate. First of all, they stove the heads of two of the great powder barrels, and they heaped the contents out upon the table and floor. They piled it round under the three drunken men until each sprawled in a heap of it. Then they carried Sharky to the gun, and they triced him sitting over the porthole, with his body about a foot from the muzzle. Wriggling as he would, he could not move an inch either to right or left, and the dumb man trussed him up with the sailor's cunning, so that there was no chance that he should work free. "'Now, you bloody devil,' said Copley Banks softly, "'you must listen to what I have to say to you, for they are the last words that you will hear. You are my man now, and I have bought you at a price, for I have given all that a man can give here below, and I have given my soul as well.' To reach you, I've had to sink to your level. For two years I strove against it, hoping that some other way might come, but I learned that there was no other way. I've robbed, and I have murdered. Worse still, I have laughed and lived with you, and all for the one end. And now my time has come, and you will die as I would have you die, seeing the shadow creeping slowly upon you and the devil waiting for you in the shadow. Sharkin could hear the hoarse voices of his rovers singing their chanty over the water. Where is the trader of Stepney Town? Wake her up, shake her up, every stick of bandit. Where is the trader of Stepney Town? His gold's on the capstan, his blood's on his gown. All for bully rover Jack, reaching on the weather tack, right across the lowland sea. The words came clear to his ear, and just outside he could hear two men pacing backwards and forwards upon the deck. And yet he was helpless, staring down the mouth of the nine-pounder, unable to move an inch or so to utter as much as a groan. Again there came the burst of voices from the deck of the bark. So it's up and it's over to Stornoway Bay. Pack it on, crack it on, try her with the stun sails. It's off on a bowland to Stornoway Bay. Where the liquor is good and the lasses are gay. Waiting for their bully Jack. Watching for him sailing back. Right across the lowland sea. To the dying pirate the jovial words and rollicking tune made his own fate seem the harsher. But there was no softening in his venomous blue eyes. Copley Banks had brushed away the priming of the gun and had sprinkled fresh powder over the touch hole. Then he had taken up the candle and cut it to the length of about an inch. This he placed upon the loose powder at the breech of the gun. Then he scattered powder thickly over the floor beneath, so that when the candle fell at the recoil, it must explode the huge pile in which the three drunkards were wallowing. "'You've made others look death in the face, Sharky,' said he. "'Now it has come to be your own turn. You and these swine here shall go together.' He let the candle end as he spoke, and blew out the other lights upon the table. Then he passed out with the dumb man, and he locked the cabin door upon the outer side. But before he closed it, he took an exultant look backwards and received one last curse from those unconquerable eyes. In the single dim circle of light that ivory white face, with the gleam of moisture upon the high, bald forehead, was the last he had ever seen of Sharky. There was a skiff alongside, and in it Copley Banks and the dumb steward made their way to the beach, and looked back upon the brig riding in the moonlight just outside the shadow of the palm trees. They waited and waited, watching the dim light which shone through the stern port. 
and then at last there came a dull thud of a gun and an instant later the shattering crash of the explosion the long sleek black bark the sweep of white sand and the fringe of nodding feathery palm trees sprang into dazzling light and back into darkness again voices screamed and called upon the bay then copley banks his heart singing with him touched his companion upon the shoulder they plunged together into the lonely jungle of the caicos End of chapter 4